There was a famous preacher back in the last century. His name was Henry Fosdick, and he preached. He was pastor of Riverside Church in New York City. And he told a story about when he was a kid, his mom asked him to go and pick cranberries. Well, he didn't want to go pick cranberries. Now, that doesn't sound like fun. But he went out there, and his mom had asked him to pick one quart of cranberries. So what Henry did to make it a little bit more fun was he decided that he would challenge himself not to pick one quart, but to pick two quarts of raspberries. And when he challenged him to do that, it suddenly turned from something he had to do to something he wanted to do because he wanted to impress his mother. Isn't it amazing how your attitude can be changed by just a little thing? And you know, 50 years later, he still remembered that story because he changed his attitude. There was a, many years ago in, in England, they were building this big cathedral. And uh, a news reporter thought he would go out and interview the workers who were building the cathedral just to get their opinion. So he went to one worker and he said, so tell me about this cathedral you're building. What do you think? And he said, well, I'm putting in 10 hours a day. And that's a long day. I said, okay. He went to another worker and he said, so what do you think about building this great cathedral? And he said, I'm cutting stone for only 10 shillings a day. Okay. Went to a third worker and the worker said, I am partnering with Sir Christopher Wren to build one of the greatest cathedrals in Europe. Now, let me ask you of those three, which do you think had a good attitude? The third one, right? Because he wasn't just working for 10 hours a day or just working for 10 shillings a day. He was working to build a great cathedral. And so one day he would look back and say, I had a part of that, building that great cathedral. Attitude is everything, right? Your attitude really affects how you look at life and, and how you see things. And, and again, it, it has a huge thing. There was a, a, a widow, an older a lady, and she had two sons. One of her sons sold umbrellas. So when she would get up in the morning and she would look outside, if it was going to be a sunny, nice day, she was depressed. Why? Because her son couldn't sell umbrellas right? Nobody needs an umbrella when there's no rain, so she was depressed. On the other hand, she had another son who sold fans. So when it was cool outside, she was depressed. But when it was warm outside, she was happy because he was selling fans. But this poor old widow was always depressed because if it wasn't raining, she was depressed. If it was uh, cool outside, she was depressed and not warm. So finally, she was talking to a friend one day, and her friend said, you have this all backwards. Perk up. I mean, if the sun is shining, then people are going to buy your son's fans. And if it's raining, they're going to buy your other son's umbrellas. So either way, your boys are making money. There's money coming into the household. And once she realized that's true, her attitude changed. So whether it was sunny or whether it was rainy, she was happy because one of her sons was making money. Your attitude changes, right? Your attitude has a lot to do. It affects you. So turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 15. And I'm not going to re-preach Brother John's message last week, but I'm going to piggyback off of it because he did an excellent job talking about the first section, and I'm going to talk about the back section of this parable. And it's a very famous parable. But before we get into it, I just want to set the stage here so that you remember what's going on. Luke chapter 15 starts with this little bit of no information here. Luke chapter 15 says, verse 1, all the tax collectors and sinners were approaching listening to Jesus. They wanted to hear Jesus. And it says in verse 2 that the Pharisees and the scribes were complaining. This man welcomes sinners. And he eats with them. So just to set the stage of Luke 15, you have two groups of people. Group one, you have the tax collectors, okay, which were considered the bad people. They were the IRS agents. 
nobody likes getting a letter from the IRS. Okay, <clears throat> so nobody liked the tax collectors. And then there were the sinners. These were people that lived in public sin. A lot of times they were the prostitutes, the, the people that nobody wanted around. But they wanted to hear Jesus. They were trying to get up front. They wanted to hear him. And the other group was the Pharisees, the religious people with the long flowing robes who said big prayers. And they were complaining about the fact that the tax collectors and sinners wanted to hear from Jesus. So Luke sets the stage in Luke 15 with telling us what is going on. One group wants to hear from Jesus, the tax collectors and sinners, and the other group is complaining about Jesus. And so the first thing Luke does after setting the stage is he tells us Jesus speaks a parable, and it's about the man with the one sheep that went astray, right? He left the 99 and went and found the one and brought him back. And then he follows it with another parable of the woman with the lost coin. She had 10 coins. She loses one. She sweeps the house until she finds the one coin. And so Luke is telling us that God pursues people. He wants people. God wants people. He wants the lost sheep. He wants the lost coin. God loves people. And that's what Luke is conveying here through the Holy Spirit, is that God loves people. And if you look at verses 7 and 10, after both times when the man finds the sheep, when the woman finds the coin, there's rejoicing. Both of them end with basically the same thing. And, and Jesus tells us that there's rejoicing in heaven when one person gives their heart to Jesus. You say, how does that happen? Well, the way you give your heart to Jesus is you have to come to a point in your life when you realize, I am the lost sheep. I don't know Christ. I don't know how to get to heaven. I, I'm, I'm no good. And we all are no good, bottom line. Compared to God, nobody's good, right? Paul said no one's righteous. And so a person who gets to that point and says, I need Jesus, I need somebody to save me, Lord, save me, that's when you're found. Now, how do you get to that point? The Holy Spirit, Jesus said in John 16, convicts everybody of their sin, righteousness and judgment. And so if you're watching this morning or here and you're saying, I don't know if I, if I know Jesus, I don't know if I'm going to heaven, I don't know what's going to happen, I'm telling you, you're lost. But that's the Holy Spirit pulling you and drawing you and saying, I'm ready to find you. Call to me. Call to me. Ask me to save you. Ask me to come into your heart. Turn from your sin and yourself and give your heart and life to Jesus. So we had the first two parables. Now, what's interesting is God likes numbers. Do you know that? God likes numbers. There are certain numbers that in the Bible you see like 40, 40 days in the wilderness, 40 days, the flood, all these 40s. And a couple numbers that are very popular in the Bible are the numbers 3, and the number seven. Both those numbers represent completeness. For example, we don't say God is holy. We say holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. Why do we say it three times? It's the idea he's completely holy. God is completely set apart from his creation. There's no incompleteness in God. And it's fascinating to me because, like I said, when God likes numbers. And so when I see something that has a number in Scripture, it kind of perks my ears. What I noticed here was this is the third parable. There's three parables in a row. What is God saying, the Holy Spirit saying to us? God completely pursues people. And God loves people. And so we're going to hear this third parable. I know a lot of you know that. But I want you to hear it again this morning, because sometimes I hear people say, you know, Jim, <laughs> if I walked into that church building, the roof would cave in. You ever had somebody tell you that? If I came to church, you know, the whole place would fall down. Let me tell you something. The exact opposite would happen. Because God wants people. He loves people. So let's look at this parable one more time. We're going to look at the backside of it, and, and just, but let's walk through it from the beginning. So this is the third parable. A man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, 
Father, give me the share of the estate I have coming to me. So he distributed the assets to them. Now, many days later, the younger son gathered together all he had and traveled to a distant country where he squandered his entire estate in foolish living. After he had spent everything, a severe famine struck that country and he had nothing. Then he went back to work for one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his field to feed the pigs. So again, a very, very low point. He, long, he longed to eat his fill from the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one would give him anything. And when he had come to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired workers have more than enough food, and here I am dying of hunger? I'll get up, go to my father, and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son, Make me like one of your hired workers. Now again, Pastor John did a great job last week preaching this part of the parable, so I'm not going to re-preach it this morning. You can listen to it online. It's on our website. But here you have this young man who got his inheritance, basically said, you're as good as dead to me, Dad, left his father's house, went into a far country, left his father's protection, squandered all of his money. A famine occurred, which he lost everything in the famine. He lost all of his money, and he consequently lost his friends. Do you think they were really his friends? No. He was just partying, right? They were tagging along for the party. So he lost all those people, and then he, here he is feeding pigs, which for a Jewish person was the lowest of the low. Okay? Feeding the pigs... He's suffering the consequences for his sin. He comes to his senses and says, I've got to go back. I've got to go home. And I'm going to do this. I'm going to confess my sin to my father. I'm going to admit to my father, I messed up. I made a mistake. And so look at verse 20. So he got up and he went to his father. But while the son was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with with compassion. There are two attitudes that are happening in Luke chapter 15. And you have to decide which attitude you're going to have towards those who are struggling. The first attitude is the attitude of compassion. I mean, look at, look at, look at this passage here, okay? Look at the father. He, he had this attitude of compassion. He, he sees his son. And then look at verse 20. He ran and he threw his arms around his neck and he kissed him. Remember, there were two groups that Jesus is telling this parable to, the tax collectors and sinners who want to hear from Jesus, and then there are the Pharisees who are complaining about Jesus. Two groups that are going here. Again, why do you think the tax collectors and the, Pharisees and the, the, the sinners want to hear from Jesus? Why do you think? One word, compassion. When they came to Jesus, they felt compassion. Does that mean that Jesus said it was okay for them to live in sin? No. But they felt compassion. Did they feel compassion towards the Pharisees? No. That's why they never wanted to hang around the Pharisees. And you look at this story, and in this story you have this father, and again you go back to that verse that says, he was filled with compassion when he saw his son. Think about that. How could he be filled with compassion? His son had taken his inheritance, moved out, squandered his inheritance, basically told his father, you're as good as dead to me. And yet when his dad sees his son, he's filled with compassion. How can that father be so full of compassion? Would you be full of compassion if your kid did that to you? You see, when the father sees his son coming, the reason he's filled with compassion is he knows what's happened. His boy's coming home because he's lost everything. He realizes that his son, yeah, his son walked into a life of sin, and now he's lost his dignity, he's lost his inheritance, and he's lost his way. You know, 
if you're a good father, those are your fathers, you want the best for your child, even if your child hurts you, because you will always love that child. And when the father sees his son, no matter how much his son has hurt him, he knows his son is hurting more because his son has paid a heavy price. You know, if you were to go up to a Pharisee back then and put a microphone and say, do you have compassion on sinners? The Pharisee would be like, yes, I am filled with great compassion. Then why aren't the sinners wanting to hang out with you? Because he said he was full of compassion, but was the Pharisees really full of compassion? No. They were more interested in their rules and their regulations than they were people. One thing I discovered many years ago when I um, started pastoring was, uh, and I was in the Deep South, and wonderful people down there. I have a lot of great friends there. And I know this is the case in the North as well. There were a lot of small little churches, little churches. And a lot of churches would put together little mission trips, and they would go to distant countries. And one thing I learned was a lot of churches would go on mission trips and they'd come back and they'd tell about sharing the gospel and all that. But when the mission field came to the church, a lot of them didn't want it. If people walked into the church that didn't look like them, they didn't want them. If people walked into the church that maybe had a past that was known about, they didn't want them. And what was really odd is like, I'll go to the mission field, but I don't want the mission field to come to me. That's kind of the Pharisee attitude, isn't it? Oh yeah, I'll do these things, but at the end of the day, I really don't want you around me. It's one thing to say you have compassion. It's another thing to actually prove you have compassion, right? And, and, and here's this father, and he's filled with compassion. He runs and he throws his arm. He's not just saying he's a compassionate daddy. He's showing it. He's running towards his son. I'm sure, you know, you can kind of, I, I just kind of vision this, you know, the father's out working in the field, and he looks up, and you can see the heat waves coming off the horizon. And he sees his son just kind of walking towards him, probably limping, probably hungry. And the father looks up. Who breaks into the run? Daddy. Daddy drops everything and just starts running as fast as he can. Who throws his arms around him? Daddy. Who kisses him? Daddy. I'm sure the son is just absolutely shocked because that is not what he expected. That's not the reception that he expected. Remember, the son had this rehearsed speech because he felt like, in the son's mind, he thought, if, when I come home and daddy sees me, daddy's going to come out and he's going to be angry. He's going to be smacking his hand. What's wrong with you, boy? I told you. That's what he's expecting. The son's expecting, I'm going to have to get on my face and grovel and hope that daddy takes me in. But that's not what happens. Daddy completely shocks him. Daddy runs and throws his arms around him and kisses him and, and loves on him. Why? Because he loves his son. He loves his son. Folks, if you've had that attitude, or maybe you're watching online, if I ever walked into that church building, the ceiling would fall in. Let me tell you what would happen is daddy would run towards you, God, and say, I'm glad you're here. So we have this idea sometimes that, that God is some sort of angry God. He's not angry. He wants all to come to repentance. That's why he died on the cross. He wants everybody. No matter what you've done in your life, no matter how far you've ran, his love is enough. His grace is enough for you. What is grace? It's getting what you don't deserve. I don't deserve eternal life. You don't either. None of us are good. That's grace, right? That's our Father. And so the father runs and throws his arms around his son, and his son says, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be your son. Now again, 
Notice the son. The son confesses. All right? So, so this relationship with God is God's not like throwing his arms around saying, oh, that's fine, you can keep living in your sin. No. The son confesses. You want that relationship with dad to be right? Guess what? You have to admit sometimes when you blow it, right? We've all been there. You know, you did something wrong as a kid, and now there's a little bit of urn between you and your parents. What do you have to do? Hey, I messed up. I'm sorry. It's called reconciliation. The son confesses, I messed up. Now, and again, the, 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 does the father say, you're right, you really messed up. You really messed up with my stuff. Does he say that? No. Look at what the father does. The father told his servants, quick, bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet and then bring the fatted calf. And I notice this is the fatted calf, so it must have been the only one, right? It's like the choice calf. And slaughter it and let's celebrate with a feast because this son of mine was dead and he's alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. It's the same result as the lost coin and the lost sheep. When they're found, there's celebration. It's the same ending. Jesus says, whenever the lost are found, there is celebration. Again, there's two groups listening to this. There's the tax collectors and sinners who want to hear from Jesus because they know Jesus has compassion. And then you have the Pharisees who are just complaining about it because they're not filled with compassion. Now, in the first two parables of the lost sheep and the lost coin, Jesus didn't target the Pharisees. He targeted the tax collectors and sinners. And in this part, he is targeting the tax collectors and sinners. They're the lost son, okay, who's come back home, who is now found. He was dead, but he's now alive. But now in the second half of the parable, Jesus lowers the boom on the Pharisees who are complaining because they don't have the attitude of compassion. They have the attitude of contempt. And look at what he says. Now his older son was in the field, and as he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he summoned one of the servants, questioning him what these things meant. Your brother is here, he told him, and your father has slaughtered the fatted calf because he has him back safe and sound. Now, you would think the, younger, the older brother would be like, yes, but then he became angry. And he didn't want to go in. So his father came out and pleaded with him. Do you see the contrast? Do you see the contrast between the oldest and the youngest? Do you see the contrast between the father and the son? The father was filled with compassion. His son had come home. The oldest son is filled con with contempt. He won't even go inside. I'll just stay out here. I'm not going to go in there. I'm not going to go in there to the party. Why is he mad? Look, if you remember the beginning of the story, the father divided his inheritance between the two sons, right? The oldest son has still had his money. He was still living with dad. He still had all the luxuries of dad. He had everything that dad had to offer, plus his inheritance. He hadn't lost anything. Why is he so mad? He hadn't been humiliated by feeding pigs. He hadn't lost it all. Why is he so mad? So the father came out and, and he pleaded with him. But he replied, the oldest son replied to his father, Look, now watch this. I have been slaving many years for you. And I have never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me a goat so that I could celebrate with my friends. Would you say this oldest son had a bad attitude? <laughs> he had a bad attitude. And he not only had a bad attitude about his brother, he actually had a bad attitude about his father. Look at how he talks to his father, okay? It doesn't sound like to me that he enjoys working with his father. For years I have been slaving 
That doesn't sound like somebody with a good attitude. For you, and I have never disobeyed your orders. That doesn't sound like he really enjoys working with his dad. And yet you never gave me a goat. Can I explain something to you? There is a difference between religion and a relationship. Let me say that again. There's a difference between religion and a relationship. Many people have religion. What is religion? Do this, do that. Don't do this, don't do that. Do these little prayers. Do these little actions. Go through these motions, okay? Many people have that. Why? Because they think that makes God happy, but inside their heart, I think there's resentment. Why do I have to go to church on Sunday morning? Why do I have to do this? Why do I have to do that? Why do we have to do that? Religion creates a sense of enslavement. It does. I've got to do this. I better keep Il Papa happy. I better keep Father happy so I'll make sure I'll give some money. You know, maybe God will let me into heaven. Listen, let me explain something. For many people, Christianity is just a religion. It's not a religion. True Christianity is about a relationship. And that's the difference. Sometimes people will say to me, well, I'm not a very religious person. Good, neither am I. Well, aren't you a pastor? Yes, but I'm not a religious person. What do you mean? I have a relationship. It's not about a bunch of do's and don'ts for me. It's not a sense that I'm enslaved to God and I just have to do this to somehow make Father happy. Again, you look at this thing, and it's just all these, I have been slaving, and I have never disobeyed your orders, and you never gave me a goat. There's a lot of resentment here. The, the eldest son, all he was focused on was himself. Look at all that I've had to do for you. And why haven't you done what I want you to do for me? His focus was on how good he was. Look how good I am. I'm the good son. Why don't you care about me? See, religion focuses on what you do for God. Religion focuses on what God, can God give me because I did this for you, then you owe this to me. Religion has resentment in it. And look at verse 30. Because he's so angry, he's so full of resentment. But when this son of yours, this youngest son, came, who has devoured your assets with prostitutes, I mean, he's just getting raw here. You slaughtered the fatted calf for him. I mean, again, check the attitude. When this son of yours... He's got a bad attitude about this. Again, religion resents others who say they know God but do not live the way they think they should live. Religion focuses on people's past. Religion resents when God blesses those who have a, quote, past. You see, you can summarize the attitude of a religious person towards God and lost people as contempt or resentment. If you have contempt or resentment for people that are coming into the church building who don't look like you, you're a religious person. You don't have a relationship with God. It's a difference. This is a gut check. When you resent somebody with a past coming to Christ and God changing their life, and you resent that, like, well, look at all the stuff they did in the past, but now they're, you know, they're serving in, in ministry. How You're a religious person. You don't realize that it's not about religion. It's about a relationship. If you read your Bible, because, well, I just got to do it. I got to get through my quiet time so I can check it off. You're a religious person. If you're like, oh, I'm going to give some money. Yeah, here's $3, whatever. You know, I gave my money. You're a religious person. Y'all see the difference? Religious people do things because they feel like they have to. A relationship person says, I want to. I want to go to church on Sunday morning and be with my brothers and sisters. I want to see people come to know Jesus. I want to be in a fellowship of believers who look different than me. 
because one day it's going to be like that in heaven, folks. Better get used to it, <laughs> and it's going to be awesome. All right. I don't know what language we're going to speak up there, but it's going to be a heavenly one. It's going to be incredible. See, a relationship person says, I love you, Father. And, and I do what I do not because it's a burden, but because I love you. And because I want to serve you. I, I want to give my life away. I, I want to do this because you thought I was worthy. And so you came and saved my life. You thought I was worth dying for. And so I, I, I want to give to you. I want to serve you. But see, the religious person says, in there, and they may, now on the outside, they may have a smile on Sunday morning. I love Jesus. But inside, they resent what God's doing. Don't be a religious person. Be a person in a relationship with Christ and with God. Have the attitude of the Father. Church, when somebody comes into our fellowship that doesn't look like you, wrap your arms around them and say, well, not everybody likes hugs, by the way, okay? Let me offer the fist bump, okay? Shake the hand, all right? Welcome them. We're glad you're here. Amen. Welcome. Everybody's welcome. When somebody gives their heart and life to Jesus, celebrate, right? Because they've been lost, but now they're found. Yes. Celebrate. That is a relationship. You know, again, a lot of people have this idea that God is like this angry God. And that was how the Pharisees viewed God, as an angry God who just waiting to thump on people. But remember what Jesus said in Matthew 11. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and look at this, and I will give you rest. Think about this. And this, is, this might blow your mind. And even if you're a believer, again, we should sin less, right? Grace is not an excuse to sin. But at the same time, we do. Sometimes we stumble and we fall. We're human. And many of us, maybe you, grew up with this idea that when you mess up, God's just like, I'm going to... No. You know that when one of your children is hurting as a parent, what do you want to do? You want to kiss the boo-boo? Right? You want to put some medicine on it? If you're a child of God, when you fall down and scrape your knee and sin, do you think God's up there like, I'm going to really frap him over the head on this one? No. He's a loving father. You know what? He's actually drawn to you and says, I want to kiss the boo-boo. Come to dad. Come to dad. Tell me what happened. Okay. I'll forgive you. Let's kiss the boo-boo. Let's get back up. That's a paradigm shift for some people. Because a lot of us grew up with the angry God who's just waiting on me to mess up. God doesn't want us to sin. But when we do, he's a loving God who is there. I'm ready to forgive. Come to me. All you who are laboring and heavy laden, I'll give you the rest you seek. And it's just like the young son, he blew it. He messed up. But he came home and he said, Daddy, I messed up. And Daddy said, I love you, son. I'm glad you're back. But the older son, he was mad. And the father says to the oldest son, look, you're always with me and everything you have, I have, is yours. What's the father trying to do? Son, you're seeing this whole thing backwards. Look, I want a relationship with you too. Everything I have is yours. Don't, don't have this attitude that you just got to and you you're, feel like you're enslaved. No. Everything I have is yours. Why do you have this attitude? And the question to us today is, do you have compassion or contempt for the lost? You can tell a person's attitude of their heart by how they interact with other people, especially those who don't look like them. Do they love them, or do they want to keep them at a distance? You can tell a religion, religious person by how they respond to those, especially those who have a public sin. 
when they confess their sin and come back to Father, or they give their life to Jesus for the first time. Do you hunger to spend time with God, or do you just pray because you feel like you have to? Do you give joyfully of your time, your talent, maybe your finances? Do you give joyfully because you want to be a part of Father's kingdom and serve in ministry because you have to or because you want to? Do you love others? Do you, do you, are you kind towards others because you feel like that's expected of you or because you truly love others? Is there joy in your heart in serving the Lord or is it just drudgery? Do you have compassion or contempt for the lost? You know, what would happen if everybody in this room has compassion? What would happen if all of us are in a relationship with Jesus and it's not about religion, it's about relationship? What would happen? I'll tell you what will happen and what I think is happening. God will keep bringing folks in. He'll keep bringing folks in to love on, to rejoice with, to cry with, to help. Because Father's like, you know what, there's a church that loves people. I'll bring them people. All of us. Even if you're not a member of Warren and you're a tender with us, hey, I still hope you welcome people. Right? Let's be a family. We may look differently. Who cares? Right? Who cares? We have different backgrounds. That's beautiful because we... We interact, and we learn about each other. But we're a family. So let's be like the Father and run and put our arms around the Son and say, welcome home. Welcome home. Let's pray. Father, I pray that our fellowship here today, which is your fellowship, that this, this gathering of saints will be a light in a dark world. That as Brother Jerome pointed out this morning, that we'll, we'll be an oasis where people come and we love each other because we have one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Because we're one in Christ. And it's my prayer that if somebody's here this morning that doesn't know Jesus, and they've been thinking that Jesus would be mad at them because of their past, I hope this morning they understand that the exact opposite would be true. That if they would run to Christ, he'll envelop them with his love and say, welcome home. That if they'll confess their, their sin like the son did and run to Father, Father will wrap his arms around him and say, I forgive you, welcome home. And maybe there's somebody here this morning, Lord, that has never given their heart to Jesus because they've been afraid. I pray that today they'll run to Jesus. And maybe there are some here today that know Jesus, but they've really turned their faith into a religion and not a relationship. Father, I pray that we will serve you out of love, that we won't have the attitude of the oldest son, the attitude of the Father. Father, thank you for meeting with us this morning. Thank you that you thought we were worthy enough that you came and gave your life. And it's in Jesus' name we pray.